Back on the Canary Islands, shelters are stretched beyond capacity. Spain says it will provide more tents. Everyone is probably aware of the refugee crisis happening across Africa and Europe. What you may not know is that because of the tightening of controls in the Mediterranean, specifically Italy, many of the NGO boats rescuing the fleeing refugees have been impounded or otherwise disallowed to carry out rescue operations. Word filtered back and this has forced the refugees to take another route, far more treacherous, north from the coast of Senegal and then across to the Canary Islands. Having lived on our own boat for six years now and knowing the difficulties that we've had, it's hard to imagine what it would be like for a family similar to ours to board a tiny vessel overloaded with people and set off into the open Atlantic Ocean with no real guarantee of safety or a better life on the other side. We had just sailed for three days and four nights from Madeira to Tenerife. It was a pretty stressful trip for a few different reasons that I don't need to go into right now, but still exhausted from the sail and even before our morning coffees, there was a knock on the side of the boat. I was asked to use our platform here on YouTube to help tell the story of the refugees now arriving here in the Canary Islands. I was about to join a vessel that was to patrol the islands and help spot and even potentially rescue refugees. It was quite a bit to digest. So we've just spotted one now, straight ahead. So we were, we were sitting here, I was doing some push-ups. Lenny was naked and Elena was <laughs> I just, went for a just walk. Been come back from a walk and these guys came up to the boat. We've still got to check out their website to make sure they're not like kidnapping me or just <laughs> just completely full of shit. What I'm saying is, is that this happened to us five minutes ago. We came inside, Elena started crying and said, you've, there are you've got Lenny's to go. There are little Lenny's out there yeah. by the dozen. Little Lenny's. <laughs> Mums and dads that just want safety and they're out at sea in the most brutal conditions and they need all the help they can get. So, so I think I'm going for a week and we're going to go spot refugees and then make calls to the Spanish authorities who can properly rescue. Yeah, we've got a lot of thinking and research to do about this. I'll probably go anyway, but then if you're watching this, it means that we think this is uh, an ongoing and worthwhile cause and that the guy's respectable and legitimate, I guess. They're, they're all worries of mine immediately. And I'm taking an EPIR. After a bit of research of the organisation and in particular the journalist Natalie, it turns out that they were not just legitimate but were actually doing really, really good work. Natalie had made several large documentaries and other humanitarian issues. And so I uh, packed my passport and a few clothes and prepared to head out to sea again for the next seven days. Can you say, love you, Dad, good luck? Say, love you, Dad. I love you. I love you so much, Mookie. Oh, oh we shouldn't muck around. No, seriously, we did a serious kiss and now I'm filming, so it's kind of a muck around one, but I'm going to miss you. <laughs> love you. You say bye bye to dad. Bye bye. Say goodbye. Bye bye. bye bye. Can I have a kiss? Mwah. Cuddle. See you, mate. You'll be good for mum. See you. Au revoir. Au revoir. See you soon. Yeah. Do you have a mask? Yeah, in my pocket. Come on, come on, come on. There was Tomas, the captain, and Natalie, the journalist, who had both come to La Vagabond and asked me to join them earlier that day. Peter, who was Natalie's cinematographer, Ava, Bernd and Gerd, who were all volunteers and had been on previous missions throughout Europe. We sat down, ate some pizza and got to know each other a little. So this is my room here. This is where I'm going to be spending the next four, five or seven days, I guess, and um, I... I'll explain more about what's going on. We're going to set sail, so we've got to get everything ready, ditch all the lines, put the mainsail up, and then we're heading to the next island over where the refugee camp is, and then we're going to spend the night in that harbour and then head south and start patrolling the waters. So whew, that's what all of a sudden that's, uh, that's what we're doing, all right? Hello, 
Pacific East, Pacific East, Tenerife Traffic, Tenerife Traffic Calic. So we've just left Morgan. We uh, sailed overnight. We're heading out to the area south of Gran Canaria. We're patrolling this area, and what I'm led to believe, it makes perfect sense. It, it can't happen any other way. If the refugee boats miss this spot, I mean, they're gone. They're just gonna, they're gonna drift into the Atlantic. The next stop is gonna be the Caribbean, but they're just, they're not gonna make it that far. So, um, we're, we're gonna patrol that area and try to locate some boats and let the Spanish authorities know where they are. So I'd just like to speak a little bit about Elena and myself and our two-year-old son, Lenny, and our time on the water and how that makes me feel about this situation or the things that I think that I know because of that. So when, when we're sailing along and it blows up to 20 knots, 30 knots, 40 knots, something like that, and we're in a 48-foot catamaran with a fridge and a GPS and solid rigging and an autopilot, um, I'm, I'm worried and I'm petrified for Lenny, you know? I just, I always think about him. And then, because there's a bit of debate as to whether or not these people sort of deserve refugee status. The contentious point often spoken about in the media is whether or not these migrants technically deserve refugee status. Are they abandoning their homes because of economic reasons? And does that qualify or disqualify people? How bad does the situation need to be to warrant refugee status? The fact that you got in the boat just proves it. To me, anyway. What are some reasons that they, that they might be leaving? You live in a country, you're married, you have three or four children, um, the economy is down, there are problems maybe with religious uh, things, problems maybe there is uh, a war or something. You have no schools for your, for your children, uh, so you have no perspective uh, for your family. So what will you do, Riley? Yeah. I think I will flee with my family. Mm. We're sailing vessel uh, Gemini. Can you please repeat uh, the position of this uh, wooden boat? There was a general report over the radio about six floating wooden objects and their coordinates that were to be avoided by all mariners. In the past, I wouldn't have thought about that again, but immediately the mood on board was just really low. Boats and no people on board can pretty much only mean two things. We hoped that they'd been rescued by the Spanish authorities and taken to the refugee camp in Gran Canaria. It was an odd mix of people, which is exactly what I thought it would be. A ragtag bunch of misfits, rogues and ruffians all joined towards a common goal. Without knowing too much about these people, I could be certain that they were good people, and so I liked them. Their real-world experience, seeing the absolute extreme of exploitative or hateful violence and actual torture, as it happens, committed against some of the migrants, and then also the highest peak of human generosity and selflessness, made for some pretty emotional sunset discussions. People's political views and discussion of the nuance of immigration was varied, enlightening, and at times fairly bleak. Uh, yeah, when we planned to go into Mogan, we stay several days longer, and then we will see, and then we can do more work on, on the land. The next thing is you have to think about the migrants. They cannot uh, realize weather situations like us, and they cannot see how the weather develops in 10 days, and when they started, they started. We arrived early in the morning seeking shelter in the port of Morgan and tied off to the dock. Most of us got some sleep, there were some repairs to be made to the mainsail and slide cars, and more supplies were to be brought on board. All good, all good.
I don't know how familiar you are with the with the selfies. <laughs> Not very. <laughs> so, what's the latest, Natalie? Uh, the latest is that um, we try to fix the sail, mm -hmm. and we are going back closer to um, the coastline of Africa. Yeah. And just trying to find some boats still. There's there's some bad weather coming. Yes, it is. Yeah. So that when bad weather's uh, coming, we are we can't get out. And the, but the good thing is the boats also can't get out. So yeah, it's quite yeah. safe then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then there's also some schedule problems with the bad weather, and people are trying to get you and I off and then get the boat back out again. Yes, and there's yes, some really yes. bad weather coming later on. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, we hear all the time these um, these calls like boats are outside, wooden boats are found, and um, yeah. For me, it's always then I feel really bad then because I don't know what's going on there. We can't find them. We can't see them. And... I just hope that. The, those calls with the floating boats that they've been rescued. Yeah, hopefully. But you when think, they find, no, but they saying? always say wooden boats, uh, no people. Yeah. And when there are no people, you can imagine where the people are when they're not on the boat anymore. I saw a flip flop at the water. It's, it's drifting along our boat. Yeah. And you don't know from when, from when the flip flop is coming. Yeah. Maybe it's a refugee. The thing is, you really have to watch the sea. You either you're watch, uh, looking out for uh, refugee boats or boats like the typical wooden boats um, or um, inflated boats, rubber boats. Um, but sometimes in the Mediterranean, it happens to other NGOs. I, I wasn't on a, I haven't seen one yet, but corpse maybe they are passing by and um, on the other bigger NGO boats in the Mediterranean you always learn what what are you going to do with this so they always have these big bags they try to get the cops out of the water put them in the bag and bring them then to mainland Europe so they that they can get buried hello with 995 uh millibar in the center this is like a like a little hurricane i think uh it's not possible it's not safe enough uh, to stay outside uh, in the next days uh, for the next 24 hours i think it's okay uh, but then we have to look for a safe harbor uh, for us So we've just spotted one now, straight ahead. It's probably about half a mile away. Everyone's like jumping and... When we spotted the vessel on the horizon, there was a washing machine of conflicting emotions just all over the vessel. Spending day after day concentrating behind the binoculars with just eyes burning from the sun's reflection had finally paid off, so we were pretty happy, even excited, but it was also obviously a very sombre moment. There's adrenaline as you approach and your mind is racing with all the various possibilities like will we need to provide medical assistance, should we call it in to the Spanish authorities or will it be necessary to bring like 30 extra people on board our vessel? You're both worried and excited, bubbling with a nervous sort of pre-empathy. As we approached and it became clear that there was no one on board, there was this immense sense of loss on board, like we hadn't done enough. For a brief millisecond, I felt disappointed that I'd missed out on rescuing someone before the realities of just the lives of the people on board became more clear as I climbed on board. Like, how would 30 people even fit in such a small boat? This is like really sad. The conditions on board are just like you would imagine for a boat that's had probably 20 or 30 people in it for 10 days. So, I mean, we're kind of really weird mixed emotions because you're happy to find it, but also seeing the realities of it up close, you're just like, it's just, it's horrendous.
Eventually, we arrive back in the port and we pass the processing station where they hold the refugees before they're moved on to the camp. The plan over the next few days, whilst the bad weather passed, was to investigate more into what was going on on land here. These are all the lucky ones. They made it. Yep. But I'm wondering how far they can get now from here. In Moria, these people are stuck forever in these camps. It's been a super busy morning. <clears throat> I actually got in touch with one of our patrons who, strangely enough, works in a dive shop, which is at the bottom of, uh, we couldn't believe it. She works in, at a, in one of the hotels where the refugees go after their, the, the small number that are allowed to leave the camp when they go to a hotel. She works at the bottom of one of them and knows them, knows the hotel owner, and that's where we're gonna go this morning. In, a, in like a mad rush, like it's just, oh, this is bizarre. We jumped in the car to go check out one of the camps before going to meet up with a patron of ours who was helping us to organise the interview with Limon. Limon was one of the earlier refugees to be released into a hotel from the camp and had been really, really helpful to the hotel owners who just loved him and also the subsequent refugees that had been passing through. Okay, we come to the studio. This girl just came from, from Madrid searching for his, uh, her cousin that arrived uh, one week ago in a, in a small boat. She, could, she arrived this morning, she couldn't find it until now. She is really excited. Uh, because she was from the port to all, visiting all the places where the people is staying. And she just uh, got to him right now. It's quite exciting. No. For those of you that understandably can't understand what's going on here, this lady has been searching for this guy, which is her cousin for the past week. We'd seen her standing at the entrance to several of the different camps, just quietly weeping to herself. Somehow, miraculously, we happened to be there when they were reunited. He had survived the boat ride over from Africa and has been in one of the camps and apparently uncontactable for the past week. He was very hungry. We are just giving him some food in the boot, out of the boot here. Uh, as important as, as this is, I find it really difficult to film someone when they, they're not super keen. For me, it's always unbelievable to meet these people because they made it over the sea. It's, for me, it's like they're from, from another planet because it's so unbelievable for me that they really made it in a small wooden boat over the sea. So they are heroes. Mm. They are so brave. And they did all that to, to have the chance to become a better life. It's amazing. So what's happened is we tried to go into the hotel over here, but you can't because journalists have been coming here with bad intentions and, and putting images up of people and kind of using them to promote a bad image of the refugees and they're just sick of it and the hotel owners are as well because the hotel owners love looking after the refugees but certainly these guys do and so they're very concerned about journalists and what they're doing so Limon who really wants to do an interview with us because he knows that we're trying to do the right thing has agreed to it but we've got to go down the beach with him or just away from the hotel and there was like a 30 minute argument with local Red Cross people and local Spanish people and one dude that looked very lucky wasn't associated at all. This is incredibly confusing. What they are and what you see is only a projection. This guy's the budget. He's like a big brother to all of them. He connected everyone together and as a big community. 
a couple days ago, he saw that there's a lot of cigarettes around the property and he organized getting garbage bags and he said, if you guys want to smoke at the hotel, you're going to pick up all these cigarette butts and you're going to make sure that there's no more cigarettes left. Mm. We all said, absolutely. And they picked up bags and started cleaning. My plans is just to get a better life, that's all. I don't want to go, maybe, yeah, some guys are here. They said, I want to go to Germany, I want to go in France, I want to go somewhere, blah, 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 blah. Then the other day, the Red Cross asked me, where do I want to go? I said, actually, my own plan, I can even stay here as long as I have a job, that's all. So does your family know about your trip? And does they know that you're here? They never know, because my family, I came from a poor background family. My mother, she's in a village right now as I'm talking. I'm letting Natalie and Peter do the interviews, they're the pros of that. But um, yeah, hearing these stories is just... It's, it's just crazy. Everyone's crying. I am. So I spent about a week on board and then came back here to catch up with Elena and Lenny and, you know, clean the boat because we hadn't even done that. Take care time. of your family. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> How was it? It was pretty emotional. Difficult to do a video like, a video like that. It's very different to what we normally do. Um, the day after I left, they actually found a boat. So it would be fair to say that they had a direct hand in rescuing maybe 30 people. I don't know how many souls were on board. That is pretty incredible. What I can't believe is how you guys had to go back to port because the weather was so rough and there were still boats out there. Like nah. it was so rough that you had to go in in a catamaran and they're still out there. Like that goes to show how terrible the situation is. So Elena and I are gonna do a GoFundMe, the same as what we did for the Australian bushfires. The money for this one will be, I'm at a guess, mostly go towards SARA. If, if we do a little bit more research and find some other organizations, NGOs that we think are worthwhile, we might do it there. But rest assured, it will go towards um, the rescuing of refugees. So if you think that's a worthwhile cause, we do, then yeah, we encourage you to chip in. The links for all of that, the GoFundMe will be in the description below, no doubt. We'll plaster it everywhere. Personally, these videos are very different to what we usually make. I find it difficult to be so earnest. I'm generally more sarcastic or stupid or wrap myself up in, a, in, in that sort of thing. But this was- Important. Yeah. And it, fell did, on our and it fell on our doorstep. I just hate being the cliche influencer. influencer trying yeah. to save the world. Yeah. Yeah, but this one's really worth it. Thank you all for watching. Please donate to the GoFundMe link in the description below. And if you want more information, there'll be some on that SARA website. And if you want even more information, I'll find it for you. And we'll put that in the comment section below. Thanks.